Thank you very much. So good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, just um, one minute to uh, get ready and start sharing our presentation. So welcome everyone. Um, we are very happy that uh, Saint-Gobain is joining this uh, net zero solutions around the, wo the world in 24 hours. And we would like to uh, thank the World Green Building Council for inviting us today. Um, we will be pleased to share uh, different uh, views and expertise all along the, the, this presentation. We will be together for one hour. And please feel free to raise at any time your questions uh, in the Q&A uh, chat box, and uh, we, will, uh, we will answer them. Next slide, please. So today, uh, we will have uh, um, three speakers uh, with us. Um, Alain Zanoli, the Vice uh, President Innovation for the Asia Pacific region. He will be introducing the Saint-Gobain Group um, and our Asia-Pacific region. And he will then share a commitment toward carbon neutrality for 2050. We will then move to uh, net zero emissions in operation that will be handled by uh, Milan Gorai, our technology and industrial performance director for Southeast Asia. And we will end up with our solutions for uh, sustainable construction with uh, Hank Fan, uh, Sustainable Market Development Director for the Asia Pacific. So carbon neutrality for Saint-Gobain is, uh, you will see a challenge and an opportunity. Um, Saint-Gobain uh, can actually impact in two sides. The first one being the, uh, on our manufacturing processes um, to reduce our carbon footprint in the planet, but also through the product that we are manufacturing as they have a positive impact and help our clients uh, decreasing their own uh, carbon footprint. So we will first start with a presentation of, of Saint-Gobain for you all to uh, understand what we are doing. And I give now the floor to Alain Zanoli. Hello, everybody. Uh, wish you a good afternoon, good morning, good evening. And my pleasure to introduce the Saint-Gobain group to you. Next slide, please. So Saint-Gobain uh, is uh, an organization that uh, is structured around, around the three markets, mobility, construction, and the industry. To make a, a quick presentation about the sectors in which we are operating, I could say that uh, in Europe, we are involved in uh, renovation and light construction, in North America and emerging markets in construction and all over the world in, uh, in industry decarbonization. Next slide, please. So uh, a quick uh, overview about uh, uh, the numbers regarding our organization. First, to uh, reiterate uh, what my colleague said about the fact that in 2017, we have committed to achieve carbon neutrality in 2050. So we are uh, operating in uh, 75 countries, founded uh, out of France uh, 350 years ago, so a long, long history. Uh, now reaching out the, the whole world, uh, we have around uh, 170,000 employees, 800 uh, manufacturing facilities, a turnover of about 45 billion euros. And uh, in most of our businesses, we are uh, we are leader either in Europe or in, uh, in on a worldwide basis. We have uh, uh, since few years uh, refined our uh, purpose uh, by uh, working with all our employees and come up with this uh, uh, purpose of making the world a better home. So we have a, a profound ambition, uh, supported by all our employees, to act every day to make the world. A more beautiful and sustainable place to live. And this is materializing into our ambition to uh, reach net zero carbon by 2050. 
to be the, the our vision is to be the worldwide leader in light and sustainable construction through a, a worldwide program called Go and Impact. We would, uh, to achieve uh, this objective of improving daily life, we will work through uh, uh, six different uh, pillars, um, working on those markets where the, the growth is very high and the demand is also, uh, by proposing solutions, uh, customer-centric around the, the needs of our customers. We have a very strong uh, corporate and social responsibility approach, uh, empowering our, our employees through the uh, uh, trust and empowerment and collaboration culture and working with diversity and inclusiveness. Next slide, please. So let, let's now have a closer look to the Asia Pacific region for Saint Gobain, where we have been present since 1972. Next slide, please. So in the region, Saint Gobain represents about 10,000 employees. Uh, if we focus on the construction uh, related industry, we are uh, we are participating and having leading position in uh, products such as plaster, plasterboard, mortars, glass wood, uh, fiber cement, or tile adhesive. And we are uh, operating in more than 80 manufacturing facilities in the region. Next slide, please. I said before that uh, innovation is a, is a key uh, a lever for achieving uh, the, our purpose. At the global level, uh, Saint Gobain is operating uh, eight uh, transfer and centers and more than 100 development centers, regrouping around uh, 4,000 researchers and a bit less marketing people and finding around 400 patents. At the in the Asian region, uh, we have one of the main uh, transversal R&D center located in Shanghai. Next slide, please. Some uh, iconic projects uh, recently uh, uh, achieved in the, in the region. So you can see in China, uh, we uh, were a main supplier of construction material and solution for the Beijing Daxing Airport. Uh, also participating to the Beijing City Tower in, in, uh, in China. And more recently, we have uh, been uh, a supplier, of, uh, key supplier of materials for the Shanghai Assembly Museum and also for the Legislative Assembly in Thailand. Next slide, please. So let's talk about our journey towards carbon neutrality. Next slide, please. So to uh, to uh, walk around this uh, journey, uh, Saint Gobain has developed a very strong uh, ESG culture, environmental, societal, and governance. And this is recognized uh, by the top uh, leading uh, scoring agencies and uh, third party assessment bodies, which are well ranking us among the, the top company in our area regarding this uh, ESG uh, uh, culture. Next slide, please. So to uh, develop uh, uh, our program around ESG, uh, we work on the two sides of the equation. We want to maximize our impact on the society and minimize the footprint of our organization. We have identified six areas uh, to achieve this vision, climate change, and I will develop this part uh, later on, but also the circular economy, uh, to uh, decrease and minimize our impact on natural resources, working on health and safety across the whole value chain, including growth and uh, employee engagement and diversity. And one very important item, if you want to uh, achieve all this, is to have a very high business ethic. Let's focus now on the climate change. Next slide, please. Okay, you all know uh, well, I guess, and uh, that uh, the construction industry 
when we look at it from a, an overall perspective, a cradle to grave type of approach, is a, a very important contributor to the carbon dioxide emission. Uh, around 40% of the worldwide uh, carbon dioxide emission are related to the to the construction industry. So, obviously, uh, us being the main provider of material for the construction industry, we have been uh, acting uh, in all different uh, materials and solutions to maximize our impact on the society, to decrease the carbon emission uh, of the of the construction industry. So, overall, when we look at uh, our uh, uh, no, please stay on the. Uh, overall, when we look at our impact, um, we can say that uh, we have around. Excuse me, can you go back to the previous slide? When we look at our uh, overall uh, impact on the on the society, every year we avoid around 1,300 metric tons, 100 300 million tons of uh, of uh, emission uh, for our customers. And uh, if we compare it to our own uh, emissions, when looking at the three scopes, we are uh, generating 40 times the savings versus what we generate for making those materials. So a very big leverage on the reduction of the emission on uh, the operation of our customers. Well, we act, uh, and this is giving just a few examples, uh, on the insulation, of course, uh, we are, uh, for example, uh, providing uh, external thermal insulation system, ethics, or uh, internal uh, insulation system, either for general or technical insulation, as is the case for HVAC systems. Those have a very big impact on the consumption of energy, on the emission of the CO2, uh, like uh, you see the numbers for ethics, 70%, for uh, technical insulation, up to 95%. We are also uh, a main contributor to uh, uh, very high efficient uh, glazing solutions. You see here an example of one of our products, Eclas, which is bringing, compared to uh, state of the art uh, solution today, 10% uh, additional insulation power, whatever it is, uh, uh, double glazing or triple glazing. We are also contributing to uh, road, road construction, um, sustainability with uh, our glass grid reinforcement products for increasing the road life up to three times. Next slide, please. So the other side of the equation is to minimize our footprint. Uh, the next presentation will focus on that, but let me give you a quick overview um, of what we do uh, in this area. Examples, uh, like for uh, our glass operation, you see this one in Italy, where we are achieving minus 15% energy consumption, and therefore carbon footprint decreased too. Um, actually, you may have heard or read recently that Saint-Gobain has been the first company to achieve a zero net carbon operation for a flat glass furnace and, uh, in Europe. Uh, and this is uh, obtained through glass recycling and uh, biofuel usage. At this point, it is a pilot, but it shows the commitment of our company to invest in innovation and to focus on the reduction of its uh, footprint in terms of uh, carbon dioxide. We are also working in uh, all, all across the planet uh, on uh, securing power purchase agreement, which is supporting our goal to electrify our uh, operation. And uh, as well, we are uh, several programs to reduce our carbon footprint when it comes to our logistics and transportation. Not to be forgotten that we are uh, have been committed to reduce the water, with water withdrawal from our facilities, and we have already achieved 18% in 2017. So scope one and two for us, uh, the short-term goals by 2030 is to, is to decrease by 33% uh, our carbon footprint in scope one and two, versus uh, our starting point, which was 2017. Next slide, please. So here, here you see um, uh, the, the practical goal we have given ourselves. 
as I explained, this uh, carbon reduction program for 2050, achieving carbon neutrality, it's, it's, a, it's an overall commitment by our company, but it is cascaded down to each country, each entity. And to make it very practical and very efficient, we have decomposed this goal with several milestones. The first milestone we need to achieve is 2030. So here you see what are the objectives we have compared to uh, our starting point in 2017. Withdrawal of, uh, of water, industrial water withdrawal should be decreased by 50% in 2030. The carbon footprint should be decreased by 33% for scope one and two, and by 16% by, by for scope three. Also very stringent goal on uh, circular economy with a decrease of 80% of our non-valorized uh, production residues and uh, increase by 30% the, uh, the avoidance of virgin raw materials in our processes. And also we will have 100% life cycle analysis for all our group products ranges. So you see it's, uh, it's practical, it's ambitious, it's decomposed uh, in details for each our organization, each our country. If we look at Asia Pacific, you see on the on the right hand side that uh, we have already achieved a decrease of 43% compared to 2017 for scope one and two. So we are well on the way to achieve and, and overcome our goals. But we need to keep in mind that Asia is a, is a fast growing area for our business. So in order to achieve the 33% by uh, absolute volume in 2030, we need to continue to work hard on reducing our carbon footprint. Next slide, please. So if we want to be systematic, consistent, global, as well as local, we need to work on the six pillars of action. Obviously, the energy efficiency of our processes is critical. And uh, you will see uh, later on in our, in our next presentation uh, an example of what we do. Switching our processes to less carbon intensive energy is also, also very critical. For scope three, it's extremely important to uh, work with our raw material suppliers. And you will see an example of a, a partnership that we are developing in this area later on in my presentation. And it is very critical because very often the, the main, uh, the, the most important component of the carbon emission is coming from suppliers. Is a very sorry, I'm making by some message. It, it's a very powerful, powerful way to uh, act on the carbon footprint uh, of our operation and uh, of the carbon footprint of our customers because we are their scope three. So uh, please go to the next slide. I will show uh, uh, example about what you what we could do to leverage this. Uh, uh, product design and material formulation uh, pillar to uh, help us achieve our goal for 2050. So in this slide, um, I, I will explain uh, taking uh, one type of action we can have on the uh, formulation uh, of our materials to uh, decrease uh, the carbon footprint of our solution. This approach that I want to describe here is uh, related to the maximization of the usage of industrial waste to formulate our products. Uh, many, many industrial waste that actually can be turned into materials, valuable materials for us, and low carbon and sometimes zero carbon uh, material uh, for, uh, uh, for the formulation of our product. Example are DSG, uh, it's a desulfuration gypsum from the, the coal plant where to, su to suppress the sulfur emission, uh, calcia is, uh, is sprayed in the fumes and uh, creates gypsum. Uh, fly ashes also from uh, uh, the uh, power plants uh, using uh, either coal or biosource material. Iron and, slide, iron and steel slag from the steel industry or deconstruction waste from the construction industry. Another way is also to incorporate as much as possible recycled materials. 
to achieve that, to be able to use those uh, source of material which are very helpful for the carbon neutrality. If you do it at the time of formulation of the product, it's much easier than to do it later on when the product is already formulated and sold. So we have a very important action lever here at the R&D and innovation side to work with those materials. So two examples you saw this below. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, this is an example about uh, uh, mortars. Our organization, Weber, is, a, is one of the leading organizations to provide mortar to the construction industry. In mortar, the two constituents, the two main constituents are the cement and the sand. Cement, as you know, is a, is a heavy weight in terms of carbon footprint. So there are substitutes that are possible for uh, cement. Um, one of them is uh, fly, fly ash coming from uh, in that example we show uh, uh, rice, rice dust. So ashes from rice dust Uh, one ton, one ton of, uh, of collet, we can save up to 300 kg of CO2 and reduce by 30% the energy needed to uh, melt the glass. So it's very, uh, very powerful level. Next slide, please. So this will be my, my, my last slide where I illustrate uh, the, the purpose uh, I was mentioning before of working with our suppliers. Again, I'm repeating that for most of the construction products, the carbon footprint is both in our hands in scope one and two as the manufacturers, but also, and sometimes a lot in the hand of our suppliers. So we need to work with them very closely to achieve this goal of carbon neutrality uh, by 2050 that we have set for our company. Here I'm showing the example, a uh, very recent one, you may have seen in the press, Saint-Gobain has the joint forces with the Shandong Yongfang Steel Company, which is one of the leading steel industry uh, in China, uh, to uh, collaborate on the innovation side. So we are really in this field of uh, formulation of our product. On the Yongfang side, they are willing to participate to the decarbonation of the building and the steel industry through the valorization of the waste production. They are producing a large quantity of waste. This is the, the case of all the steel industry, uh, steel, steel slag, iron, sla iron slag, flying ash, DSG. So they have all of those the waste materials that can be valorized. On the Saint-Gobain side, as I explained, I explained before, we are willing to use our innovation resources to find the best way to use Yongfeng waste materials, and to use these terms waste materials to say that we can transform the materials, the waste into materials for designing low carbon building materials. You see the, uh, the, the goal we want to achieve. Today, if you take a standard mortar, uh, the binder of this mortar is uh, uh, using for most of it. Uh, OPC means the ordinary Portland cement, which is carrying a high load of uh, carbon footprint, and it's already some level of uh, waste materials of uh, uh, waste industrial waste with low carbon content. Our goal in this collaborative program is to reach a green binder by uh, five years maximum. We know to do it earlier to be able to have a binder in our mortar which will be at more than seventy percent and in some cases. Thank you.
of innovation and product validation can significantly contribute to that. So the next presentation that we need to hear about how we are uh, managing our operations to the things that happen to the So we have the floor is yours now. Thank you very much, uh, Alain. I'm sorry that we had uh, some uh, sound issues uh, a little bit, but uh, uh, quite limited. So uh, thank you uh, very much for this presentation. Um, we jump now into uh, net zero emissions in our operations to give you concrete example how Sangoba is handling um, the reduction of uh, carbon emissions uh, within its own production. I give now the floor to Milan Gorai. <clears throat> Good afternoon to all the attendees and uh, also good morning and good evening wherever it is applicable. So I will take you through to a few of my slides, uh, how we are making our operations more efficient in a very uh, challenging uh, environment in the Southeast Asia. So it's a very uh, uh, challenging and motivating uh, both at the same time and we have no choice but to to uh, to make it happen as our uh, one of our major corporate purpose in today's context uh, our customers our consumers they are um, getting more inclined to be associated with the organizations who are socially more responsible so in more uh, their commitment to their business and uh, they are reducing increasingly their support for the companies who are uh, not being able to give them the unsustainable solutions. Employees want their employers to make uh, positive contributions to the society and employees have a preference also to join the organizations who are making such commitments. Carbon neutrality commitment uh, by many APEC countries each country has set their own targets and goals to be uh, net carbon neutral by uh, certain years, 2050, 2060, 2060 for China. But uh, in all uh, the countries, power generating companies in ASEAN have a common target to become net zero by, by 2050. So it's all very demanding in time, resource and knowledge. Next slide. So in, in, in Asia Pacific, uh, we operate in a very uh, large variety of uh, situations where economic development is not the same story for each country. Environmental awareness among the societies and the business community and in the, among the leaders is also uh, different. And also the commitment of the uh, governments towards environmental uh, concerns. So in some countries, uh, the environmental approach is uh, given a priority to get a commercial uh, advantage. But in some other countries, it is uh, uh, moving a bit on uh, low speed to keep the cost advantage. But we have the all uh, uh, responsibility to adapt our speed to execute our projects uh, in a unique direction given from our uh, corporate uh, uh, leadership. So it's a positive reaction from all our Asian teams in Asia Pacific. It's a great enthusiasm with uh, increasing knowledge. We have uh, developed a core team, both at the central and also at the regional team. And we have made a highly structured organization to execute our pro projects. So it's a top-down, bottom-up approach. Uh, St. Goban Group has uh, given us the corporate targets and the, each country has prepared a, a kind of very robust <clears throat> roadmap to execute their projects. I'll take you through some of the uh, some of the pillars. Uh, my previous uh, speaker, my colleague Alain, has mentioned we are actually executing our uh, all projects uh, to achieve uh, uh, our climate 2050 target to be net zero by 2050 using the six pillars. In the first pillar, he has mentioned about the uh, formulation change using the waste reels. 
I'll take you through the rest of the pillars briefly. Pillar two is the energy efficiency, where we are minimizing our wastage of energy, either by minimizing the losses or also by improving the, our recovery system, like uh, heat losses through the through the equipment due to poor maintenance, poor insulation. So we uh, we are uh, measuring using the latest tools and improving it. Then uh, pillar three, we are switching over to the greener energy. So be it uh, solar, be it uh, green electricity certificates, be it purchase power agreement, power purchase agreement with the organizations who are uh, uh, who are uh, generating the green energy, technological breakthrough, and nonetheless. Uh, we are closely following up the development of hydrogen technology for the uh, energy uh, generation. Uh, on the fourth pillar, it's the raw materials. Uh, it's not only we are trying to uh, uh, source our raw materials based on the cost only, but also we are evaluating it with the associated uh, carbon footprint. We are highly structured in this activity. We have a central purchasing team who has prepared a huge database for the carbon footprint associated with each raw materials. And we are working with our suppliers to, to find out what is the carbon footprint associated with their products. And at the same time, when we are going for the new purchase or new alternative suppliers, we are keeping in mind as a key, a key, a key characteristic uh, to be evaluated while we purchase our uh, raw materials. Next slide. So on transport, uh, this is the, our uh, fifth pillar on the transport. It is our very strong effort to source all the raw materials and uh, other services locally to the extent possible and also to improve the improve the efficiency of the fuel consumption and then find out alternative fuels like biofuels replace road transportation by rail and water transport and also delivering the full service rather than rather than uh, sending the products in an isolated and dedicated uh, uh, transport system so by this uh, we have developed a culture we call multi drop where one one ton consignment can deliver a complete solution, minimizing the carbon footprint associated with the transport. So just for example, we can say that one boat is the uh, uh, release of the carbon footprint of approximately two trains and 120 uh, small trucks. Next slide. So the last one, which is carbon removal, of course, while we are making very uh, concerted efforts to reduce our energy consumption and hence reducing the carbon footprint at the same time if we are working also consciously if we can uh, eliminate some amount of carbon footprint from the from the emissions we create so be it uh, through reuse through mineralization or through a uh, kind of organic process or through storage Though we are in the very uh, beginning of this stage, but we are, are remaining focused on this. Next slide, please. So if we uh, see what we have achieved and what is our immediate target, uh, almost uh, 2000, in 2017, uh, we almost emitted 1 million uh, ton of carbon uh, uh, dioxide from the business in Asia Pacific. And we are uh, in 2030, we'll be reducing it by minus 34% in spite of our almost very close to double digit growth in the region. And we have identified our projects, which is almost double the number of the projects we identified a couple of years ago. And uh, as I mentioned, we have a very uh, structured steering committee to execute such projects. And we have no doubt we will be achieving 34% reduction by 2030, which is our immediate target. Now I will take you through some examples which we actually have implemented. Silly, next slide. Uh, we used to use uh, uh, natural gas or compressed uh, gas as a source of heat energy, but uh, 
Uh, in that case, we, we are wasting our uh, some calorific value and we modified it to become a cogeneration where we generate compressed hot air and that drives our turbine, which generates electricity and the spent heat, which uh, generates hot air is used for the drying process. Just by modifying this, we could reduce our energy consumption by 32 to 35%. But the size of such equipment uh, is a, a bit large for a large industry. It is a, a good solution. And this is, we have implemented in uh, our plant in Thailand, which is a very, one of the largest manufacturing facility we have. Next slide. Uh, other two examples I'm sharing with you uh, is that from our corporate, we have a target of reducing energy consumption year by year, minimum 1.5%, expectation is 2% every year. Last two years, we have achieved 5%, and in next three years, we'll be achieving 5% through our internal energy efficiency improvement projects. We use a lot of water in our manufacturing process. We will be uh, reducing this energy consumption just by reducing the water consumption with the small, small process improvements. But the big two improvements we are expecting by beyond 2025, where we'll be able to reduce our water consumption more than 10%. In line with our vision, that uh, we want to be a uh, sustainable and lightweight uh, product uh, solution to our customers. We have been uh, reducing our uh, raw material consumption since 2017. We are one of the first to introduce lightweight construction materials in the region. Today, in last five years, we have reduced almost 20% of our raw material consumption, keeping the, our product quality even better what we used to have five years ago. Next slide, please. Solar uh, uh, photovoltaic cell is one of the greenest and uh, greenest electrical energy available in the region. And we have been implementing it in a, to a great extent. Uh, uh, it's in Thailand, in Malaysia, also in China and Vietnam. And the factories where we are operating from, operating for one shift operation, day operation, by doing this, we'll be reducing 80% of our current carbon footprint. And uh, for the plants, uh, due to complexity of the manufacturing, where we operate for 24 hours, we'll be reducing almost 22% of our carbon footprint. Next slide, please. Biomass is also uh, available in plenty in the region, but it's, a, it's a, uh, a type which is very peculiar to the country of origin, locality, and its uh, availability supply chain. So it has its own pros and cons. We are in an advanced stage of uh, kind of breakthrough technology to use biomass to produce electricity and hot air. That will give us a huge mileage in reducing our a carbon footprint by using the biomass. Uh, in today's world, we are going for more and more uh, automation in our manufacturing process. So we are implementing uh, uh, pneumatic operated lot of uh, automation. And in that case, we used compressed air. And compressed air technology has been evolving very uh, quickly. And over the last one decade, it has uh, evolved uh, like anything. So using the latest uh, compressed air uh, uh, system, compression system, uh, replacing the 10 years, even 10 years old compression system, one can reduce the energy consumption by almost 20, 25%. This is what we have been doing in all our manufacturing factories. Next slide. So implementing this project, you can see we reduce 35% electrical consumption in one of our plants. So that's all I uh, thought of sharing with you, some of the examples and some of the uh, levers of our examples, which we are following to execute our net zero initiatives in Asia Pacific region. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Milan. And um, we will now move to our uh, third and last part. Um, as you have seen, we, are, we have seen the, the operation size. Uh, so it's how uh, Saint-Gobain is decreasing its own carbon footprint um, uh, with a very uh, challenging but uh, um, 
nice plan and, and carbon roadmap to achieve carbon neutrality in 2050. We are now going to look at the other side of, uh, of the challenge, I would say, um, and share with you some of our solutions uh, for sustainable construction. So in order to once again, decrease also the uh, carbon footprint impact uh, of our own customers. I give now the floor to Han. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, uh, our Asian college, and good morning to our WGBC. And thank you for having me here. And in the previous presentation, my college has shared our strategy and action towards the net zero carbon in our operation. And in this presentation, I will share how the single band products and solution can help you, architect and specifier to reduce the energy consumption and carbon emission through building's whole life cycle. Just to remind us that building have a key role to play in decarbonization and our sector contribute close to 40% of the total emissions in which 11% represents the embodied carbon, which is the carbon linked to the production, transportation and construction of material and 38% linked to the building operation. And the challenge of the sector is to reduce the carbon emission over the whole life cycle. Next, please. So decarbonization of the building sector needs a whole life cycle approach. And in the net zero carbon commitment signatory, uh, WGBC requesting leading companies to commit on both net zero for both operational and embodied carbon. And to achieve the target, there are mainly three group of actions we can implement at the building level. Uh, first and foremost is to reduce the need and optimize their energy demand uh, in, in building operation. And second, divert from fossil fuel and use uh, renewable energy. And last but not least is to reduce the embodied carbon emission or use the low carbon footprint material in the building. So acting on the whole life cycle of the building with two dimensions of operational carbon and embodied carbon is essential. Can you get back to the previous? <laughs> yeah. So by acting on both dimension uh, of operational carbon and uh, embodied carbon with the three group of actions is essential to have to uh, achieve the full decarbonization of the sector. And today the operational carbon uh, accounted for two thirds of the carbon through the building life cycle, while embodied carbon is about one third. But this proportion will change in the very near future when we do better with energy efficiency. So it's likely that the proportion of embodied carbon will increase in the future. In my next slide, I will share about the first uh, action group, which is to reduce and optimize energy demand in building operations. And with this action, uh, with Saint Bowen, we encourage the fabric first approach, which ensuring the high performance of buildings thermal enveloped. Through that, the heating and cooling energy can be reduced. And this uh, principle applies for both uh, deep uh, renovation of existing buildings and uh, design of the new building. In the tropical climate, as the condition of most of the Asia Pacific countries, the use of lightweight construction material with low thermal mass is preferable, particularly on walls that are exposed to sun. This is because the lightweight construction material respond quickly to the cooling breeze and allowing the building to cool faster. Just to clarify thermal mass, referring to the ability of building materials to absorb, store, and release heat. So for tropical climate, in principle, the use of the low thermal mass material is uh, preferred. This material has somehow still required the insulation to prevent direct heat transfer and to prove the energy efficiency of the mechanical cooling system. So what we can do is to add more insulation to the lightweight building envelope to reduce heat gain or loss, or uh, using the glazing to let the sunlight in but block the heat out, uh, using smart membranes to improve air tightness and moisture management for the envelope. 
But the starting point is to measure and disclose energy consumption of the building with the smart technologies to monitor and control. And uh, using the high performance uh, HVAC, like heating and cooling equipment. So out of this uh, group of action with single solution, we can contribute to the first uh, three uh, actions. Uh, I will explain further in the next slide. So here are the, some solution that uh, we provide to help you improve the energy efficiency in the building. Uh, insulations uh, with the glass food uh, products. Uh, so to enhance the thermal insulation of the envelope, it helps to reduce the carbon emission relating to heating and cooling by 40%. Or the uh, external thermal insulated uh, composite system, it can be fully uh, uh, thermal insulation or half uh, thermal insulation system. It combining the smart membranes and insulation uh, property that help to improve the air tightness as well as uh, thermal insulation property of the envelope. And we also provide the uh, high performance uh, double or triple glazing that help to allow the sun in but block the heat out and so on. And next, please. So if you look a uh, closer look at our insulation product, it is a glass wood insulation product called Isover. By using Isover insulation in building envelope for the whole life cycle of a building around 50 years, it will help to set energy consumption up to 300 times the energy need during its production. So it takes only three months to offset the emission relating to its whole life cycle. Next, please. The second group of action is reducing the embodied carbon emission in the building material, which means reduce the quantity of carbon embedded in the material through its whole life cycle from the raw material extraction, manufacturing, transportation, installation, and apply treatment, so on and so forth. And the key indicator here is building life cycle assessment of global warming potential measured by kilogram CO2 equivalent. And the greatest opportunity for the specifier and architect to reduce the embodied carbon is at design stage when you can have a simulation of different design scheme and option, uh, different uh, material or component, components uh, options. And from there, you can choose the lowest carbon embedded uh, solution and material, which uh, commonly are material with a high level of recycle content. The material with the, use the alternative raw material. I will explain further uh, this concept later and the lightweight uh, construction solution. So these are the solutions that have the low embodied carbon in the building. Next, please. Uh, we pro provided a low carbon solution such as, uh, you can see on the top right is the lightweight drywall system. This to be used in replacement of bricks and blocks in interior uh, wall. Uh, this is a lightweight system uh, to replace a uh, heavy weight uh, uh, traditional system. Or we have the cement free motor. We all know that uh, cement is a very high embody carbon material. So by using alternative raw material, such as uh, industrial waste from uh, metal processing, from uh, glass recycling or fly ash and so on and so forth, we can reduce up to 70% of the embodied carbon in the material. The other material like glazing or glass wound, we also use very high rate of uh, recycle content. And um, by using waste to become material, we resolve several issues at the same time. It not only to reduce the carbon emissions associated with the raw material processing, it also addressed the issue of resource scarcity, the depletion of virgin raw material. We want to reduce the dependence on the virgin raw material. 
and also to resolve the issue with the landfill waste generation. So waste is not being wasted, waste becoming a resources and used as an input for the new production cycle. So these are the direction of the circular economy. Uh, next slide. So you question us, uh, how can we prove what we claim? How can you know that our solution have low air body carbon? To answer that, uh, we use the life cycle assessment and environmental product declaration. So you probably know that life cycle assessment is a methodology to assess the environmental performance of a product at every step of its life cycle. And it takes into account not only carbon footprint, but also operation, etc. And the uh, EPD environmental product declaration uh, is the document that gather all the results from uh, life cycle analysis and disclose all information and not hiding the black points. So it is. Standard and uh, verified by I EPDs, uh, including all sectors and, and across the different activities such as insulation, gypsum, web, and glass, and so forth, in different 30 for different countries. Next, please. Next slide, please. So here is the illustration. Uh, yeah, can you back one slide? Yes. Here is the illustration of uh, EPD report that we comparing the environmental um, impact of the two wall system. These are the wall system using as internal wall. And in the left hand side is insulated metal stud drywall using um, plasterboard and metal stud. Uh, left and right hand side is a cement plaster on 100 mm brick. And we analyze the environmental impact such as uh, global warming, energy use, uh, weight, and uh, water uses. And you can see on the right hand side um, the result. If uh, for one square meter of partition walls using drywall system instead of traditional system would save close to 80% uh, reduction in global warming potential. It is measured by kilogram CO2 equivalent. Or the uses of primary energy use is reduced close to 70%. The weight of the drywall system, it is lightweight, of course, so it is slightly more than 10% of the heavy brickwall system. And the reduction in fresh water use on installation on site is also reduced by 81%. And we also put the, the next slide, uh, we will show you the assessment uh, of the entire projects. So we're comparing the environmental benefit of our solution in an actual case. This is a multi uh, family housing in Thailand. And here we put the two system in, in calculation. Uh, the lightweight construction uh, and we use a lightweight system for facade system and answer for internal partition with different type of product versus the standard market uh, reference that they use uh, precast concrete wall for exterior facade and uh, block concrete for internal partition. Uh, one click this. And here is the result we have in 2021. You can see that by using the lightweight solution, it helps to enhance the energy efficiency of the building. And through that, they can save up to more than 30,000 kilowatt hour a year. And also, this is a lightweight construction method. And through that, it helps to avoid the 454 tons of CO2 equivalents uh, from the MOD carbon because of the lightweight solution. And also because of lightweight system, it helped to reduce 15 metric tons of carbon safe in transportation. And for the end user, of course, they are happy because they 
the energy bill reduction is more than 130,000 Thai baht a year. So this is a very good uh, case, uh, example of how the lightweight and low embody solution can help both the environment and also the end user. And uh, next slide, please. So to conclude, to achieve the sustainable net zero carbon building, the market needs uh, energy efficient uh, solution, uh, energy efficient uh, envelopes and low CO2 footprint uh, construction material. We also need safe, healthy and more comfortable building for people. And in St. Uh, we care for both building better for people and the planet by offering our customer with an innovative solution that can help to deliver both the performance and sustainability aspects to drive the transformation of the, the construction market. And towards the net zero carbon building commitment of WGBC, we provide the solutions which can contribute to reduce and optimize energy demand of the operation um, the building, as well as solution to reduce the embodied carbon emission in material to tackle the whole life impact of buildings and views on GBC whole life carbon vision. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Anaheim. Thank you, Milan. Thank you, Alain. Um, we are almost uh, um, almost reached the, uh, an hour, but there, there, were, there was one question that raised out, uh, maybe for you, Alain. Um, uh, you, you were sh uh, sharing earlier in your presentation that uh, uh, buildings represent 40% uh, of the total emissions, CO2 emissions on the planet. Um, how do you, um, why do you think that uh, governments are so much focusing on the automotive pollution and, uh, and, and not the building pollution? Um, as you know, I think it's quite uh, uh, famous for everybody that uh, automotive are a very heavy uh, polluer of the planet. Uh, but we see in your presentation that actually building also contributes to uh, even a larger part of the, of the CO2 emissions. So what is your point of view on that? Well, first, I think uh, um, things are evolving. Uh, many countries are uh, really pushing hard now to uh, also um, uh, focus on the construction industry and uh, the case, for example, in Europe. But it's true that uh, it's, uh, the policies have been uh, moving faster on, uh, on mobility. I think it is related to the fact that it's a, it's a less deep fuel that for the construction industry. Because the construction industry, uh, you know, the, the, the carbon footprint is coming from many different players, from, from the mining uh, to, the, to the deconstruction. So it's very diffused and therefore it's more difficult to capture. But I think it's doable and uh, we see uh, progressively the countries to align for that. And, and we are pretty sure in Saint-Gobain that this is going to become a key topic for the next 10 years. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I give now the floor to the host to uh, uh, transfer to the next uh, session. Thank you very much uh, to you all for attending uh, our Saint-Gobain uh, sharing experience.